In the first segment of this video, I motivated the concept of developing a consistent pre-shot routine and pool. And I'd like to continue that conversation by recommending you view every pool shot as consisting of three distinct segments, planning, followed by setup, followed by execution. And these three segments are separated by two points of no return, P-O-N-R-1, Poner-1, and Poner-2. Uh, Poner-1 is the point beyond which you will not do any more planning for the shot. So all the planning is done and the, and the plan is set. Poner 2 is the point uh, beyond which the shot will definitely happen a few moments later. So it's the point at which the fuse is lit and you're not going to go back. So it looks like this. Poner 1, the beginning of the setup phase, is the moment you begin to approach the table along the line of the shot to get into your stance. Poner 2, the beginning of the execution phase, is the moment you begin to draw your cue back on the final backstroke. So anything between these two points and you're in the setup phase. So when people talk about getting down on the shot and taking warm-up strokes and, and things not looking right and you get up and start over again, what you're doing is recycling through the setup phase and you always go back to Poner 1. You never go back into the, to the planning stage. The dashed ovals in the setup phase are an indication that you may return as many times as you want and from any point in that phase that you want. But once you reach Poner 2, the shot is going to happen definitely. And while you're in the planning phase, the red phase, you may recycle as many times as you like, uh, changing your plan in that phase. During the red phase, the planning phase, you do all your thinking and deciding. And as indicated by the dashed ovals in the planning phase, you can go back as many times as you like. I recommend you chalk the cue during this, this phase. And when you're confident you have a plan in mind, I recommend you step back from the table ready to approach along the line of the shot. This is your last chance to go back and do some more thinking or change your mind. Because once you begin approaching the table along the line of the shot, you've past point of no return one and you're now into the setup phase. I recommend you never go back from the setup phase into the planning phase for the same reason I recommend you never negotiate with, with terrorists. So you approach along the line of the shot, you get into the stance, uh, the first thing you do is aim statically, that is by whatever aiming technique you use, uh, and then the first few practice strokes uh, are really one of the functions is a dynamic aiming. You want to make sure that the line of the stroke of the shot matches uh, with with your aim. Another function of the practice strokes is is what I call feel strokes and these are uh, that you get the, the speed of, of the shot uh, correctly. Finally you pause with your tip at the ball. This is what some instructors call the set. Now how close should your tip be to the ball? It should be close. If you can play for five hours uh, and you probably inadvertently foul by touching the ball with your tip once during those five hours, you probably got your tip too close to the ball. But if you're confident you can play for 20 five-hour sessions without ever touching the ball with the tip, you're probably too conservative and don't have your tip close enough to the ball. Um, after you pause with your tip at the ball, you begin your slow backstroke, the final backstroke, this is the point where you've reached point of no return to, and the shot is definitely going to happen. Uh, a slow backstroke followed by a smooth forward stroke and then freezing in place. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about the execution phase, the, yell the slow backstroke, the smooth forward stroke, uh, and freezing in place. Imagine you're in position, and with no cue ball present, your forearm is undergoing rhythmic pendulum style motion, uh, stroking motion, so that the tip is going back and forth rhythmically. Now imagine some graph paper uh, is at the tip and it's streaming straight down so that your rhythmic tip motion makes traces on the graph paper that look like the curves on, on the figure here. So a slow stroke has a large sort of wavelength or a broad S and a medium stroke has a, a medium wavelength and a fast stroke has a short wavelength. Uh, it's worth thinking about these curves a little bit. Whenever a line, a, a segment of one of these curves is close to horizontal, that means the tip has moved a fairly large distance in a short amount of time. That means the tip is moving fast. 
whenever a segment of one of these curves is close to vertical, that means the tip has moved very little in a substantial time length, uh, so the tip is moving very slow. So a pause in your stroke, for instance, would be just a, a straight vertical line uh, on, on a curve like this. And it's worth thinking like this because we want strokes of various speeds. We want slow, medium, and, and fast strokes. Uh, but as you'll see, I recommend that the backstroke, the final backstroke, always be part of the slow stroke. So here is the slow backstroke that I recommend you use on every pool shot. And the trick will be to essentially glue uh, this simple motion for the backstroke to a different simple motion for the forward stroke. So the forward stroke, which can be at varying speeds, is a segment of any of a number of, of harmonic curves. And the trick is, is gluing together the slow backstroke with the generally faster forward stroke in a consistent and productive way. Here's a common problem. The, the person on the left does the proper slow backstroke, uh, but essentially rushes the forward stroke, uh, goes from the backstroke to the forward stroke uh, curve uh, too quickly. Uh, much better to do uh, like the curve on the right, where the person does the slow backstroke and stays on that s the curve, the simple curve of that slow rhythmic backstroke uh, longer, uh, and then changes to the more rapid uh, forward stroke. Uh, what this does is it gives a consistent amount of time in the vicinity of the apex of the backstroke. There are many uh, very reputable instructors who recommend and top players who use uh, a pause in the middle of the backstroke. So uh, essentially what they're doing is drawing the cue back along the slow backstroke, inserting the pause, which is the red vertical line, and then uh, going to the, the variable speed forward stroke. I'm not a fan of a pause in the backstroke for, for a number of reasons. First, a pause, uh, shown as the red segment here, requires two transitions between simple motions instead of just one. Uh, second, the indeterminate length of time, the length of the red segment of, of the pause, requires the player make a decision of when to pull the trigger, and I don't like that. Uh, second, some players, when they're making the decision of, of pulling the trigger from the pause, have a tendency to want to go back another half an inch before going forward, and that leads to a hitch in the stroke and, and some body movement, uh, or it can. Uh, and finally, a pause can mask uh, a problematically quick uh, backstroke. If the reason for the pause is to have more time, let's say to change focus, eye focus from the cue ball to the object ball, I recommend the player first uh, make sure that they are doing a slow backstroke and make sure that they are not starting the forward stroke too quickly. Uh, and if there's still not enough time, I recommend just slowing down the backstroke so that the region in the apex uh, is, is a longer period of time. So in summary, uh, every shot has a planning phase uh, when the player can do all the thinking and deciding. Uh, followed by a point of no return, poner one, where the plan is set and you move into the setup phase that begins when the player approaches along the line of the shot. Uh, the setup phase ends at point of no return two when essentially the fuse is lit for the shot and the player begins the, the slow uh, backstroke.